of the morning begins now with Mauricio Noe, who is a managing director and is the head of covered bonds at Deutsche Bank in London. He's responsible for senior bank funding at Deutsche Bank, including covered bonds and senior unsecured. Uh, and he is, as previously advertised, going to talk to us about, what was it again? Covered bonds, are they a good thing? Something like that. Something like that. Mauricio, please join us. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much. Um, this morning, I'm going to tell you how covered bonds are the cockroaches of the bond market. Um, sorry to any Queenslanders in the audience. Um, I'm, I'm ref obviously referring to the survivability of the product. Um, I'm not stupid enough to get involved in, in a discussion on the origin and, and taking sides. Um, and before I start, um, I'm almost certain there won't be time for questions, but um, you can find me outside. I'm usually somewhere near the food. Um, if you want to come and have a chat, uh, and my email address is at the bottom of my slides, so please get in touch, um, shoot me an email, um, we can have a chat on the phone or by email or whatever. Um, okay, how's this going to work? Right, um, those of you who have had the misfortune of hearing me speak before um, know that I like to outline the story so far. I'm going to go back a little bit uh, further in history uh, than the previous speaker. Um, as someone who's been coming to Australia for many years, uh, trying to uh, encourage the, the cover bond product, uh, it, it's been quite frustrating, frankly. Um, but the, uh, the rapid turnaround in recent years is, is quite staggering. Um, so the first time I came to Australia uh, to talk cover bonds was in 2005. Um, and I was told there was more chance of England winning the Ashes. Um, England did win the Ashes that year, which was just ridiculous. It was remarkable. Um, 2006. Um, on your bike, uh, 2007, please close the door from the outside. Um, 2008 was a good year, um, I'll do the jokes was the message we got. Um, and then 2009, leave me alone or I'll call the cops. Um, so it was pretty frustrating, but you know, we kept coming back and you know, it wasn't just because we like coming here and you have summer when we have winter and we get lots of air miles and stuff like that, but we actually realized there was a need for cover bonds in Australia. Um, something happened in 2010, and that was the first draft of Basel III. And suddenly everyone realized that in order to populate those Basel liquidity buffers, you need some liquid assets. Uh, and being a country in surplus, uh, you need to find some liquid assets from somewhere else, uh, which was very encouraging. Um, and we are grateful for the Basel Committee, um, not for much, but on this occasion for stimulating cover bonds in Australia. Um, and we are grateful to the regulator for, for uh, getting the joke very quickly um, and, um, and, and the government in, and putting together uh, a legislative framework. So 2011 was, brace yourself, here we come. Um, and then 2012, got to love that diversification. Uh, and many of you in this room and, and myself have traveled the world talking about diversification. It's probably the word that we've used the most uh, and hear the most, um, and you know, it, testament to that diversification is the fact that, as we previously heard, over $30 billion has been issued um, in under six months in this market, which is absolutely staggering. And I think everyone in this room should be, should be applauded for that, for their commitment and resilience through some of these dark years when, frankly, the messages that we were receiving um, from certain parties were pretty grim and pretty final. So um, well done, um, but the job's not finished. So what's the fuss about with, with covered bonds, um, and why does everyone love them so much? Um, you may have seen that the European Commission has recently put forward a bail-in proposal. The final proposal for a directive uh, came out last week. It seeks to exclude senior debt, secure debt rather, it includes senior debt, but it excludes secured debt. Um, furthermore, uh, in creating uh, larger capital buffers, both um, formal capital and also bail inable debt, that's a new word that we have to start using, Oh, can anyone help me there? Thank you, sir. They're not very good anyway, you're not missing a lot. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll keep going, but if someone could uh, put that screen onto page two, thank you very much. Um, also, the, the banks are better capitalized. The more capital is being inserted below you as a cover bondholder, both in terms of formal capital and, and the, the, the identity and the nature of that capital is to be determined, but it will f 
almost certainly uh, be a combination of, uh, of common equity and some kind of contingent instrument. Uh, and furthermore, bail-inable senior debt uh, will be inserted below. Um, Basel III enshrines cover bonds by including the product in the LCR. We know about that. I referred to it before. Um, at the moment, it's the only bank asset in the liquidity buffers. Um, I suspect that will change. Uh, we had a clue from the Basel Committee uh, last week that um, perhaps ABS would be included. Um, I suspect it will, as, alongside large cap equities and, and gold. Um, they uh, released a, 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 a QIS last week, uh, and in it they, uh, they asked for data on, on, on holdings of RMBS, um, gold and large cap equity. So I suspect it gets in. Um, NSFR encourages banks to lengthen its liabilities. I'm not sure that's happening in a hurry. Um, but when it does happen, I think obviously cover bonds will benefit from that. Um, solvency two. Cover bonds are, are, are well treated in solvency too. And then finally, uh, sovereign risk. Uh, not, not something directly relevant to, to Australia, obviously, given your lack of sovereign issuance. But you know, given the events in Europe, um, particularly around Greece, we saw obviously a very uh, severe haircut applied to Greek bondholders. I, I um, had the misfortune of having to do that transaction. Um, it's, it's, it's inconceivable to see that cover bonds would be treated the same. Uh, as, uh, as sovereign debt. In, in terms of haircuts, obviously there is a, a security package, there, is a, there are tangible assets that back the product. Therefore, it would be pretty radical uh, for a government to, to effectively change retroactively its contractual law uh, in order to, uh, to haircut cover bondholders. So you'll, you'll see a situation in, in much of the periphery where cover bonds trade well through their domestic sovereign. Um, what's the catch? It's not all good news. Um, so with, with the advent of bail-in, we started to see a lot of credit investors buying cover bonds. So the kind of guys that was, were looking at senior unsecured suddenly realized that in owning senior unsecured, particularly in a weaker bank, you were essentially owning a contingent equity product, um, depending on the, the strength of the bank. So a lot of guys switched from senior into cover bonds. So the investor base didn't actually change for a bank. Uh, it just shifted from one thing to another. There wasn't any incremental uh, investors that, that joined the party, um, although it is encouraging to see more credit-focused investors. Um, pre-2018, senior unsecured is exempt from the bail-in, so there is an element of grandfathering. Uh, so I think you know, you're going to see a lot of senior unsecured issued in the next few years to, to, to capture that. Um, and, and, the, and the final point on bail-in, which I think is very worrying, um, and is something that I would ask you all in the, in the room to keep an eye on. Um, the paper last week that I referred to from the European Commission on bail-in gives national discretion to regulators uh, to claw back the voluntary over collateralization on covered bonds. Now, this is very worrying. Um, quite how that's possible, I don't know. Uh, I have no clue if anyone has an idea how a regulator can do that over the weekend in a Lehman-style situation. Answers on a postcard, please. But I, I genuinely don't know how that's possible. But if anyone starts tinkering with the cover bond product, uh, potentially jeopardizing with the true sale or anything like that, I think it would be catastrophic. Um, so I was very dismayed to see that, that provision in the, uh, in the draft. And you know, obviously, we're working very hard to lobby to get it removed. Um, but as I say, keep an eye on it. Um, bail-in is something that uh, is a G20 initiative, uh, and as we heard from the previous speaker, Australia is in within the G20 quite comfortably, um, and so then there will be um, a gravitational pull towards bail-in in most countries, um, and if that happens, then I think we need to work very hard to make sure cover bonds are, are undeniably excluded. Um, in terms of the liquidity buffers, there's a 15% minimum haircut. Um, for cover bonds, it may make it uneconomic to hold cover bonds. That's quite a chunky haircut. Um, you may be better off holding a govy. Um, under the net stable funding ratio, if it happens, we don't know whether it happens, um, you have to uh, term fund your over collateralization, the, f the uh, famous footnote 33. Um, that's not particularly good, particularly as rating agencies uh, are going off the reservation in terms of their OC numbers. So, uh, not all good news. Solvency two. It's good news, but it's still better off for a bank, for an insurance company rather, to own government bonds, however risky they are. Um, the sovereign risk. I mentioned that a lot of cover bonds trade through their domestic sovereign. No one has yet priced, priced one through their domestic sovereign in the, in the primary market. Um, so only in the secondary market do they trade through. 
So I think until the day that they actually price through in the, in the issue market, um, you know, it's, it, there is a very strong gravitational pull for all banks, however strong they are, however well rated they are from their domestic sovereign. And then finally, the, uh, the topic of the day, the topic du jour, um, which will resonate very much with this audience, is encumbrance and structural subordination. Um, people are focusing very heavily on this now, um, investors as well as regulators. Um, I think the LTRO in Europe was something that really caught people's imagination. Um, there was a recognition that European banks were encumbering their balance sheets very, very heavily. Um, and you'll see that it's, it's something that is, gets people really quite animated. Um, and I'm going to develop that point a little bit more on the next slide. Um, th there are numerous forms of encumbrance. Central bank repos, ABS, bilateral repos, covered bonds are one of them, derivatives and other forms of charge or lien uh, on, on an asset or on the balance sheet. Um, None of them have the regulatory oversight and the safeguards of cover bonds, however. Um, all of them, almost all of them, are dynamic, just like cover bonds. And I think this is something that, uh, a point that needs to be made to, to regulators and to investors, that the LTRO in Europe is margined daily, so cover bond is margined monthly or quarterly through an asset coverage test. The LTRO is margined daily, so are most bilateral repos. Um, Master Trust ABS has, has, a, has a degree of dynamis, dynamism to it. It really is only um, standalone ABS that, that has any kind of static pool associated with it. So I think bashing cover bonds just because the pool is dynamic is rather unfortunate. Um, there is specific leg, regis, legislation. The pools are scrutinized by regulators, unlike any of these other products. Because of the legislation, the regulator takes a responsibility, a fiduciary responsibility, to, to scrutinize the pool. That doesn't happen in any of the other products. Um, there are actual encumbrance limits, and you guys will know that very well in Australia, that there are hard limits in some countries on, on encumbrance. Um, frankly, I think the levels in Australia are way too low. Um, and frankly, I feel that having a one-size-fits-all limit is uh, does not make sense either. I think it doesn't reflect the, the diverse nature of many of your balance sheets uh, and the different business models that you have. So I would firmly advocate um, a more tailor-made limit, um, such as we have in the UK at the moment. Um, the encumbrance is transparent and the issuance is public. So you know how many cover bonds are out there. You just have to go onto the website of, of an issuer and find out how many bonds are issued and how many assets are encumbered through the cover bond program. Again. Most of those other forms of encumbrance don't op operate that. Cover bond margining, as I say, it's monthly, quarterly, it's not daily. Um, and then if you look at all the countries that issue covered bonds, even the most encumbered countries only have 10% pledge to this product. It's not a lot. It really isn't a lot. And then finally, and this is something, again, that the previous speaker was, was alluding to, is that there is a public policy goal for covered bonds. It, it is put in place to... Uh, to, to uh, facilitate uh, more affordable housing, a more affordable mortgage finance, and also um, to level the playing field between the bigger and the smaller issuers. Uh, and, and again, you know, uh, it was mentioned that uh, the credit unions and, and building societies should be encouraged to come to the market, and I think that's, that's, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful aspiration, as I say, because in my mind this product um, is there um, to to, to level the playing field between the big guys and the small guys, uh, and ultimately to lower the cost of mortgage finance. Um, so the, the punchline is we, we should applaud ourselves. We, I think it's, it's remarkable what we've done in another six months and, and through very heavy lobbying and, and, and really unprecedented coordination between, between all the banks, between the issuing banks and the investment banks, the investors, the regulators. I think we should applaud ourselves. Um, we need to make sure that this product is liquid. Um, that's the next step. The, the only way that we dine at the same table as other liquid assets, such as government bonds, is to make sure this product's liquid. Um, as investment banks, we need, to tr we need to trade this very aggressively. We need to think of new ways of, of ensuring the liquidity, of giving the best service to our investors, whether that's through electronic platforms or, or CDS contracts or, or other forms of uh, liquidity enhancement. Uh, as issuers, I think you, you, know, you know you need to respond to investors' needs for liquidity in terms of satisfying uh, their hunger at the moment. Obviously, there is an, an enormous amount of investor appetite for Australian cover bonds. They might not be at the levels that you like, but it's nice to know the demand is there. Um, and I think 
all this regulatory endorsement entrenches the product. It's very good news. Uh, it means that investors have this feeling that they will be protected. Um, it's just that in putting new layers of legislation, you know, whether it's Basel III or Berlin, it, there are unintended consequences always with these things. So it's very important that we monitor every single development and make sure that our product is left alone and no one tinkers with it. Um, in terms of supply, as I say, there are natural breaks on issuance, so, and I think investors realize that, they feel that in Europe right now and in the US, that issuers aren't going to issue cover bonds to fund themselves exclusively, that senior unsecured remains very important. Um, and I think ABS is very important. We should not uh, ignore ABS. Um, I think it's coming up in the inside rail pretty fast at the moment. And when it gets included, in my mind, when rather than if, in the Basel liquidity buffers, um, I think RMBS in particular will get a real shot in the arm. So let's not give up on it. I know the market, particularly in Australia, is a little slow at the moment, but I think that market will certainly come back. And then finally, you know, don't slap us. If you're worried about encumbrance, fine. Encumbrance is, is a real issue. I'm not going to pretend it's not, but don't slap cover bonds. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think cover bonds are a very good form of encumbrance uh, and one that you can monitor very closely. Um, I urge you to, to nurture this product and, and, and recognize this product going forward. And that's everyone in, in the room. And let's be very, let's, let's be paranoid about it at all times. Let's, let's assume that you know, there will be unintended consequences of various actions that happen. And let's be very paranoid. Um, and I ask the regulators, please do not limit the ability of banks to issue this product unnecessarily. Uh, it's becoming more and more important. Uh, it's a responsible form of issuance, uh, and it's one that's easy to monitor. But please don't set arbitrary limits on the issuance. Um, so really, it just leaves me to say good luck to the cockroaches. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maurizio, and, and your cockroaches. Uh, Christoph, Christoph Annam is the next man up, and you can see who he is, head of covered bond 